Greetings and welcome to Intermediate Algebra Equations and Inequalities in One Variable Lesson 2.2 Formulas. Working with formulas is slightly different than working with equations. Here's the difference. An equation has one variable. A formula has more than one variable. So x plus 3 equals 9 is an equation. Then, something like 3x minus 4y equals 2 is a formula because we have x and y. So the only difference is it is an equation. A formula is an equation, but it has more than one variable, so we're calling it something special as in a formula. All right, so let's try an example here. We're going to find one variable given some information about the other variable. That's the really important part about formulas. If I have uh, an equation with two variables, a formula, I need to be given either the value of the one variable, so I can solve for the second variable, or I must be given the first variable in terms of the second variable. For example, uh, let's say x plus y equals 4, and x equals 2y. Well, I wasn't given the value of 2 uh, of x. I was given the value of x in terms of y. So I would have to plug that in and then solve for y. As long as I can get it down to one variable, I can solve for the both of them. Sometimes it takes multiple steps, but I can solve for them. So let's see an example. Find y when x is 4, and the formula is 3x minus 4y equals 2. What we're going to do is plug in for x and solve for y. x equals 4. So 3 times 4 minus 4y equals 2. 3 times 4 is 12. Now we're going to use the addition property of equality and subtract 12 from both sides, leaving us negative 4y equals negative 10. Divide by negative 4 using the multiplication property of equality, and we have our result of y equals 10 fourths. You do want to reduce to the lowest terms, so y equals 5 halves. All right, now sometimes, like I said, one variable is in terms of another variable. So here's an example of that. A store selling art supplies finds that they can sell X sketchbooks each week at the price of P. So the number of sketch pads they can sell is X, and the price is P. Two variables. According to the formula, X equals 900 minus 300P. That is how many sketchbooks I can sell in terms of the price. So, now, what price should they charge for each sketch pad to sell 525 pads each week? All right, so my given information, x equals 900 minus 300p, when x is 525, we're going to plug that in, you follow the steps, solve for p, which is 1.25, so $1.25. So we need to sell 525 sketch pads each week. So we can set the price to $1.25. Ooh, pardon me. All right, let's try a good old boat problem. A boat is traveling upstream against a current. We're going to let R represent the speed of the boat if it is in still water. C is the speed of the current. D is distance, T is time. And we're given the formula D equals R minus C times T. So the speed of the boat minus the speed of the current, because we are going upstream, times the time. We want to find our current, the speed of our current, when the distance is 52 miles, the rate, the speed of the boat, is 16 miles per hour, and the time is 4 hours. 
plugging in what we know and using all of our math skills, first, okay, distance is 52, speed of the boat is 16, our time is 4 hours, we're going to distribute the 4, resulting in 52 minus, uh, equals 64 minus 4c, move the 64 over by subtracting on both sides, Get negative 12 equals negative 4c, divide by negative 4 each side, and c is 3. So the speed of the current is 3 miles per hour. You do always want to answer something that has been given to you in words and not just math terms. You do want to answer that in terms of words. A complete sentence. All right. Yeah, I know, word problems, but if an object is projected in the air with initial a vertical velocity, V, and that is in feet per second, and its height in feet, and we'll call that H, after T seconds, here is our formula. H equals V times T minus 16 times T squared. We want to figure out what time is. We know the vertical velocity is 64 feet per second, and our height is 48 feet. Okay, we have three variables. We are given two of them, so we can solve this. Let's plug everything in. Height, 48 feet. V, vertical velocity, is 64 feet. The rest is in T's. So first we're going to move everything onto one side, and then we're going to factor the polynomial. So the GCF is 16, let's pull that out, gives us t squared minus 4t plus 3 equals 0. Factoring our polynomial, that gives us t minus 3 times t minus 1. We're going to divide it by both sides by 16 leaving us t minus 3 and t minus 1. Using our zero property, let's break that apart and solve for each of those equations. So t minus 3 equals 0, add 3 to both sides, you get t equals 3. Or t minus 1 equals 0, add 1 to both sides, and you get t equals 1. So for this problem, there's actually two values of t that makes this true at 3 seconds and at 1 second. And here's the reason why. When you throw something up in the air, you have, in essence, either if you straight do, uh, throw it straight up, it will eventually come back down. And if you throw something, you know, with some distance, it's going to be this arc. And because after one second, it's up as high as 48 feet, and then maybe it goes up some more. And then on its way back down, it also goes through being 48 feet high, and then it comes back down to the ground, or wherever you threw it down. Because it hits 48 feet twice, our formula finds both of those times. So after one second, it's up at 48 feet. And then it goes up some more, and then it comes back down two seconds later, um, the duration of time of three seconds, and we hit 48 seconds again, and then it comes down some more. Now, any of you that are traveling onto a business, you definitely want to know about revenue. And revenue deals with profit, okay, which is our revenue minus the cost. Our revenue which is our items that we sell for the amount that we could sell them for, so the price. And we're going to call number of items sold, we'll call that X. And we'll call the price of each item P. So our revenue, R, equals the number of items sold, X, times the price of each item, P. R equals XP. When you're given an equation, that um, 
r equals xp, and then having to use that equation, r, for revenue to find a profit, this is going to be a multi-step problem because we're going to have to find revenue, then we're going to have to plug it in, we're probably given our cost to find our profit. So this is definitely a multi-step problem if we're going to have to find profit. So let's get some information up here. All right. A manufacturer smell, uh, of small containers knows the number of calculators she can sell each week is related to the price. Well, of course. Here's what that means. I have a small calculator. We'll, we'll say it's this right here is my calculator. If I sell it for a dollar, I can sell, I don't know, maybe a hundred calculators. If the price on this calculator is now $300, uh, I might be able to sell one, but uh, probably won't sell any at all. Because <clears throat> the price is just ridiculous for this small calculator with no special features, doesn't do anything. It just uh, sits there unless you do one plus one, okay? So of course, the number of items that you sell is gonna be partly based on the price of the item. If this calculator is the calculator to end all calculators, then maybe you would pay $300 for it. But if it's just a simple calculator, of course, logically, most people wouldn't spend more than a dollar on it, so, okay. So we know, or your, this manufacturer knows, from the history of pricing out this product, they know that they can sell X amount of calculators <clears throat> will equal 1,300 minus 100 times the price. This is a given information. X, we're not given how many calculators we can sell. We're not given, oh, we sold uh, 595 calculators. No, we're given X, the, price, the, the number of items sold, in terms of the price. And, and we know the X is the number of calculators, the, price, uh, the P is the price of the calculators. So what price should we charge for each calculator if we want to sell, <clears throat> if we want a weekly revenue of $4,000? Now remember our revenue equation is in terms of X and P. We're given X in terms of P. So plugging that all in, we get our original equation R equals XP and x equals 1300 minus 100 p. Wherever the x is in the revenue equation, we're gonna plug this equation in. And then we'll have everything in terms of the price. Okay. So now we're only left with p and p in our formula. We are given what revenue we want. So we can plug that in and solve for price. <clears throat> All right. R equals 4,000. Then 4,000 equals 1,300 minus 100 P times P. I'll let you run through the step-by-step -step there and that you have to factor it. But you get down to the price is either $8 or $5. If you remember in the ball where you throw it up, that led to this arch. If you graphed this, this would also lead to an arch, and that's why you have two price points. Probably, well, more than likely, if the price is eight dollars, you'll sell you'll sell fewer calculators, but you can still end up with four thousand dollars at the price point of five dollars. You can sell more calculators, but since it's at a lower price, your profit won't be, or your revenue won't be as much. Let me get that off of, there we go. And our final write-up is, if she sells the calculators for $5 or $8 each, she will have a weekly revenue of $4,000.
Now let's jump over and talk about geometry. And we'll focus on perimeter and area. And we'll focus in on the three most popular shapes, square, rectangle, and triangle. These are formulas. I have more than one variable. P, perimeter, equals 4 times S, so 4 sides. Area of a square is A equals S squared. Rectangle, we have our perimeter equaling 2L plus 2W, or P equals 2 times L plus W, and the area is L times W. Triangle, perimeter equals all the sides added up, A plus B plus C, and the area equals 1 half base times the height. Now sometimes we are not given enough information to solve for our equation, but we do want to know how we can manipulate our formula in a way that whatever we're given, what information we are given, we'll be able to plug things in easily and solve um, for at least one of our variables. So let's talk about the perimeter of a rectangle, P equals 2L plus 2W. We want to solve for W. Oh, but we are not given our perimeter. The value of our perimeter, we're not given our length. So we're going to have to manipulate this formula to where it says W equals, meaning we move everything off to the other side. All right, first things first. Let's, since we want to solve for W, we can't touch anything that W is touching yet. We have to move everything off that side first. So anything that's touching W, as in the 2W, we can't touch yet. We have to get rid of this 2L first. Okay, at least this is my method of solving for a variable. So subtract 2L on both sides. I get P minus 2L equals 2W. Now I can divide by 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1. And P minus 2L all over 2, there's not much I can do there. So W will equal P minus 2L all over 2. Again, if we were to solve for L, we'd run through the same process and we'd get L equals P minus 2W all over 2. So here's what we know. We know our perimeter equals 2L plus 2W. We know our width equals P minus 2L all over 2. And we know our length equals P minus 2W all over 2. That's what we know. We don't have a numeric value for P or W or L, but we can solve for them. Similar to the uh, previous problem, let's talk about our rate equation and average speed. Well, distance will equal rate times time, so D equals RT. If we manipulated that formula, we know also, well, D equals R times T, R equals D over T, and T equals D over R. We have all of those manipulations at our disposal. Our average speed is the ratio of the distance to time, so that is the R equals DT. For example, we know we drove 200 miles in five hours. So we know our average speed is 40 miles per hour. We don't know our speed for any specific point in the journey, but we do know on average it was 40 miles. For example, when I travel on the freeways, maybe I'm driving 70 miles per hour, but then when I'm on surface streets, it's really bogged down and I'm driving 30 miles per hour. So you can see that um, it's not that I would drive 40 miles per hour the whole entire journey. It would be some places I'm going faster than that, some places I'm going slower than that, but the average is 40 miles per hour. All right, let's work with some more formulas. The Ferris wheel was built in 1893 and has a diameter of 250 feet. One trip around took 20 minutes. 
we're going to find the average speed of the wheel. The distance for one rotation of the wheel is equal to the wheel's circumference. Now, we need to know our circumference formula. C equals pi times diameter. And we know our distance we traveled is our circumference. So I'm just going to call that big D equals pi times D. Pi is our constant, so we're going to plug that in a second. But we know our diameter is 250 feet. So let's plug that in. We're going to use 3.14 as our rounded version of pi. We multiply that. We know our distance is 850 or eight, uh, 785 feet. Now, it took us 20 minutes to get around that Ferris wheel. It was a very slow moving Ferris wheel. So our rate of speed is our distance over time. So 785 feet over 20 minutes, we end up getting 39.3 feet per minute. That was definitely a leisurely uh, ride, not like today's rides where speed is what we like. Go fast, go fast, go fast. <laughs> Let's jump out of the application problems, word problems, and get into our abstract problem. Let's solve for x. We have ax minus 3 equals bx plus 5. All right, I have my x's on one side and on the other side constants on one side and the other side, and ultimately I just want this to say x equals something. So we want to move all the x's to one side, move all the constants to other, the other side, and then we're going to ma manipulate the x's to see what we can do there. So uh, minus bx minus bx, I get ax minus bx minus 3. Let's add 3 to both sides. Uh, then I get ax minus bx equals 8. At this point, we're going to use our distributive property and factor out x. So if we factor out x, that leaves us a minus b. So now I have x times a minus b. My goal is to get x all by itself. And it doesn't ma matter if this was 2x, I would divide by 2. If this was 3x, I would divide by 3. This is just x times junk. So I'm going to divide by that junk. So we're going to divide by a minus b to both sides. x equals 8 over a minus b. Now, yes, I know I didn't solve for x in a numerical sense, but I did solve for x because x is all by itself. And all the rest of the stuff is on the other side. Let's try another one. We're going to solve for y. In this formula, y minus b all over x minus 0 equals m. Now, I'm going to simplify it a little bit. x minus 0 is x. So we have y minus b all over x equals m. First thing I need to do is I'm trying to get y all by itself. Well, the whole entire side, the whole entire left-hand side is being divided by x. So I need to get rid of that first. Or I should say I need to get it over to the other side first. So right now, the whole entire side is being divided by x, so I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to multiply both sides by x. And then I'm going to get y minus b equals mx. Now I just need to get rid of this subtraction of b by adding b to both sides. And I get y equals mx plus b. All right. Thinking along the same lines, let's solve for y again, and we have y minus 4 over x minus 5 equals 3. Similar to the previous problem, what's happening to the whole entire side is it's being divided <clears throat> by x minus 5. If that whole entire side is getting divided by x minus 5, I have to do the reverse operation, the opposite operation, and multiply both sides by x minus 5. If I do that, those x minus 5s will go away, and I've moved it to the other side. So y minus 4 equals 3x minus 5. I'm going to add 4 to both sides. 
So that y is all by itself, thankfully, equals 3x minus 5 plus 4. We do want to simplify the right-hand side. So I'm going to distribute the 3 and then add like terms to come down to y equals 3x minus 11. You do always want to simplify. So always take it to the furthest step. Some formulas can look extremely complicated, but it's usually, think of it just like a bunch of junk that you have to move from one place to the other. And if there's a large box of junk that you can move at the same time, do that. Okay. For example, I'm going to try and solve for h. S equals 2 pi r h plus 2 pi r squared. But I need to solve for h. I need to get everything else off this right-hand side. All right. The good part about this is this is a big box of junk. I can move it all in one step. So I am going to. I'm going to subtract negative. Uh, I'm going to subtract 2 pi r squared from both sides, and I get s minus 2 r uh, 2 pi r squared equals 2 pi r h. Now again, I'm trying to get h all by itself, but this is all multiplication. I don't have to divide by 2 to each side, then divide by pi each side, then divide by r each side. No, it's a big bulky junk thing. I'm going to divide that by that whole entire thing of 2 pi r to both sides, and I get s minus 2 pi uh, r squared all over 2 pi r equals h. And just to clean it up, I flipped the side so what I'm solving for is on the left-hand side. So that is it for this lecture. Until next time, be seeing you.